So today we will discuss the generalized linear model and the learning targets for today you see on this slide. So the first learning target is to explain and apply the generalized linear model and to just to be able to describe the specifics of GLMs regarding model selection and model assumptions. On this slide you see the learning targets together with the study questions that you should be able to answer. So for example when you should use a GLM, what are the differences in the model structure between a simple linear model and a GLM and what is the typical error distribution and link functions for specific data and so on. You can go through these questions on your own. Note that if you notice that you have not fully captured the course content it is which which will hold for most of the people if you just listen to this and just go for this for one time it is certainly recommended that you have to do additional reading it is very unlikely that you fully capture the ideas just from listening or watching the slides and attending the lecture you definitely need to do additional reading and if you know the ECTS system you should have around six hours of free time to do additional reading and reflecting on this course material and you see several books suggestions on the notes to these slides in the following slides. So let's motivate the development or why we need to learn the GLM. When we have a linear relationship, and this is the case as you've seen here on this figure, we, we have this between the explanatory variable and response variable and the assumptions of the linear model should hold then we need to have constant variance as well along the spectrum. We know this when we did our regression model checking, then we discussed that we should not see a clear pattern in the residuals like an increase along the response, the fitted values of the, for the response, or that we should not see a U-shape or an S-shape or whatever. It should look like the night sky, so no clear pattern in increase or decrease. And that's what we see here on the right hand side. So the fitted value would be the mean of for the response variable uh, from this distribution of observations from this distribu that, that, that we have. And this distribution or this, this deviation from our mean along the fitted line on the left should have the same scatter along the whole line which is which is represented by fitted values. However for ecological data this relationship does not always hold. So the response variable is often non-linear and the variance is not constant and we will discuss a few examples in the next slides. So here we have the example, let's, um, let's assume we have increasing toxicity in an ecosystem and therefore species loss and what in, in, in a relationship that we might observe the, then is accelerating loss in ecosystem functioning with increasing toxicity. This might be because we have functional redundancy when we lose when we when toxicity increases, there are some um, function species left that may capture the niche of those species that have vanished and provide functional similar functions as the species that were lost. But as you have increasing toxicity, these species are lost as well, and then you have a much higher for each species that is lost or for each unit of toxicity that is, is, is an increase um, the 
loss in ecosystem functioning, extellar gray, so the relationship is exponential as we see on the left hand side. What does this mean for the variance? This typically means that the variance is not constant. At very low levels of toxicity, we don't have a high scatter in our observations. The scatter is typically relatively low, but for high values, we have a relatively high scatter, so the error variance is not constant. And another example is shown on this slide, where we have the number of offsprings against the size of the organism. And you can expect that the larger the organism, the higher the number of offsprings it delivers. Of course, this does not hold across all animal groups, but this may be here, for example, for insects, maybe the case for some insects. When we look at the relationship between the for, for in, in, the, in the population, for example, in the uh, scatter around the fitted values, first on the top graph, then we see that the standard deviation, if you have very few offsprings, is the same as if you have, for example, 12 or 14 offsprings when you move around uh, along these fitted values, which is given by the regression line. So we see there is no change in the scatter around the line. If we move to the bottom graph, you see that there is a clear increase in the scatter. We have a relatively low deviation for the for um, low fitted values, for low number of offsprings, but we have relatively high scatter if we look in the, uh, at the, at the right side of the figure where we have a standard deviation four times almost four times higher than at low levels of offsprings and here our assumption of of same variance typically um, clearly does not hold in this case so we have a clear pattern in the error variance that we need to take into account. So how can we take this into account? Well, we need to model this mean to variance relationship. And by mean, we mean here the fitted values for the response variable. So as we saw on the previous slide, we have a response variable and if we fitted this, the, 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 fit, the fitted value is always an expected mean value and the variance for this value is in the simple linear model is constant as we see in the, in the top left figure. So we have the same variance independent of the mean of the fitted values. If we move to count data, that is what we just discussed on the previous slides. We discussed the case of, of uh, number of offsprings. So number of offsprings are discrete values that are counted. If you count, for example, the number of species in the habitat patch, this is discrete data. For such count data, you often have um, mean to variance relationship that is linear. So we see this here, the mean, uh, the variance can be expressed as a function of the mean. Here it was, would just be a multiplication of the mean with the variance or the mean would equal the variance. Then we have binary data. Binary data can be, for example, the, the case when you have um, an experiment in ecotoxicology where, where you have a beaker and you count in this beaker, you have 10 organisms, for example, and you count how many organisms did survive. So you might have the case that you have 10 surviving organisms, 
or that you do yeah you have you have zero surviving organisms so if we see here if we look at the bottom left graph that the highest variance is for the for the middle between these two extremes so and this is somehow clear imagine you have an experiment where you have a very high concentration of alpha toxicants so all organisms are killed or you have an experiment where no organism is killed if you have several beakers let's say the concentration is very high and you have a um, very high mean of the more of the organisms that suffered from mortality let's say nine or ten then it's clear that there is an upper border an upper boundary you cannot have more fatal uh, more organisms that suffered from the toxicant than 10 you can also only have 10 dead organisms so if the scatter can the variance scatter which equals more or less the variance is low no, it's lower than if you look at um, um, a concentration where five organisms are surviving or killed respectively so if you have in some in one replicate you might have five surviving and another one four and another one six and another one seven and another one three so you can have an upper and lower deviation from your mean whereas if you have a mean close to 10 in our case you can't have 11 or 12 dead Daphnids in a beaker. You can only have 10, so the only deviation is towards lower values, and that's why we have a lower variance, and the same we could discuss if you have no effect. So if you have a mean of zero, let's say you have no fatalities in the control. And another type of data is displayed on the right bottom, figure in the right bottom figure this is for time to death data where we have an exponential increase in the variance over time so for a short time of the experiment we have a relatively homogeneous response to um, in the um, of organisms dying but if for uh, organisms that survive longer then we have a much higher variability So the generalized linear model is able to model this non-constant error variance that we have in different cases that we just discussed by expressing the variance as a function of the mean and in addition it introduces non-normal error distribution of residuals. So it has several different, yeah, it's the possibility to specify different error distributions um, when modeling. And we look at one example of a GLM on this slide first. So you have the simple linear regression versus the locket model that's also called lo logistic regression. And we have a case example where let's say we have the probability of occurrence of a species and we have the annual mean temperature in this area. So there has been a survey where they looked at how often, so whether this species is occurring or not occurring, you have presence absence data, the species can be absent, that means you have a zero, you know, the, you, you write down a zero during your monitoring, or you see you find the species, so you have a an, an presence case and you write down a one. So you have just zeros and ones in your response variable. If you now would put this data in R and just use the linear model, you would attain a line as shown by the red line. And that is the function, the fitted values for this line, the y, the mean y's are expressed as, um, as an intercept. Intercept, you can see this here, would be in a negative, somewhere in the negative range of probabilities of occurrence, which is very odd, it makes basically no sense because we can't have a probability lower than zero. So that's one problem with this model. And the other problem is clearly 
that our, our data are not well captured. As you can see, when you compare the fit of to the green line, which is the logit model, the logistic regression, with smooth, which smooths the data much better. The model contains on the left-hand side the so-called odds. It's a logarithm of the p divided by minus p. p is here the probability of occurrence and other specifications. You may have um, the mu here, the so-called mu in this model instead of the p. You will see this later. And on the right-hand side, we keep our linear linear function so we have b0 plus b1 times x that's this that's the linear part of the simple linear regression model that we had before let's look at the residuals for this linear model and this shows you a case where you really that you would, should really recognize as the non-matching matching assumptions of your linear regression model. On the, the top figure, we see a clear pattern is similar to an S-shape of deviation from our linear, uh, from our assumption of a normal distribution of uh, the standardized residuals. We see there's a clear pattern so this should make you quite aware that something's wrong here and even worse if we look at the standardized residuals against the fitted values you see also a clear pattern with an increase and um, no with a decrease an increase and a decrease again of the fitted values against the standardized residuals so this should really ring an alarm bell if you fit a linear model and see such patterns in the reg regression diagnostics plots, then something is clearly wrong and we discussed this before. Let's look a little bit more detailed into the logistic regression model. So we have a couple of parameters given here for this model. So let's say we fitted this model and we have uh, B0, which is equal to the intercept of minus 15.9, and we have a B1 equaling 0 0.72. Um, the intercept we see here uh, is somehow um, needs to needs a different interpretation as for the normal linear regression model we can't find of course we have a we have the probability of occurrence and to really translate these parameters in, of the model into the probability of occurrence you need to into the piece we need to back trans we would need to back transform to show a little bit how you deal with the different with, with parameters and what these what these numbers mean that you obtain we first do some calculation and we calculate the x for a p of 0 0.5 so the probability of occurrence is 0 0.5 and please do yourself the calculations for in in this case so stop the presentation and do the mathematics you have the equation on the on top of the figure um, you have the b0 given the b1 given you have the p given and now you can calculate the x you notice that the calculation was not very difficult i hope so on the left hand side of the equation you just if you enter 0 0.5 you see that this reduces to 1, you have 0 0.5 divided by 1 minus 0 0.5, it's the logarithm of 1. This equals, is the, equals to 0 on the left hand side. So we end up with a linear equation um, with a 0 on the left hand side and that's really easy to solve via reformulation and some, op some simple operations and you end up uh, finding an x of 22.1 so that's the in infliction point for 
this graph. And what we also see is that basically we have symmetry of the values around the inflection point of 0 0.5. So what you should do now is to check the symmetry by calculating the x values for p0.1 and p of 0 0.9. You will find the solutions to this small exercise in the note to the slides. We look now a little bit more into the details of the structure of the GLM compared to the linear model. As you know, the simple linear regression model, we have the y, the, observa the observation equals, or the, the, our response equals the intercept plus regression coefficient for the explanatory variable plus an error that is assumed normally distributed for our simple linear regression model. In the generalized linear model, we have a different specification. First of all, we have the linear predictor, so that part remains the same. We have again the P0 plus P1 times x, but this it does not directly equal or does that not directly add up to our response but to a variable that we introduce so-called eta and this eta is actually if you look now on the left hand side of the equation the brown square the brown square it's from generalized linear model 0.2 then we see that we have a link function here that provides an assignment or prescribes how we transform our mu and the mu is given here that is basically the fitted value in of our responses how do we transform this into the eta and that is done with the so-called link function so we apply a transformation to our response variable to obtain the eta and the third part that we need is a different error distribution of the response or not a different so the possibility a more flexible error distribution of the response compared to the simple linear model and this is achieved here by expressing the variance in our response variable as a function of the mean we have already discussed this that we introduce a function of the mean so the function of the mu which is uh, so which is equivalent to the fitted values in our response variable multiplied with a dispersion parameter that is a constant in this table in the bottom of the slide we now see different error distributions and variance functions and link functions these are typical typical assemblies so for the normal or also called gaussian error distribution you use the identity link that means eta equals mu and the variance function equals one so that is actually the case of the simple linear regression model just let's quickly look at our equations one two and three what happens if we set the link eta equals mu well then our linear predictor means that we have we have the mu equals b0 plus b1 times x and since our mu is just the fitted values we see that our fitted values for the response variable equal b0 plus b1 times x that's what we knew before already that this is the equation for the linear regression model and the error distribution for the data um, if we enter here as a variance function the variance function is the v of mu of the mean 
if we enter a 1 here, so this always equals 1, um, then this function sim simplifies variance of our response variable simplifies to the dispersion parameter that is a constant. So this just means we have a constant variance. So that confirms what we had before or is in sync with what we knew before that we that the uh, function that, that, that the variance is the same along the whole gradient of fitted y values. So it's always the same when we saw this case um, when we had the same standard deviation um, for increasing number of offsprings and a couple of slides before. A different family error distribution that is specifically used for count data is the Poisson distribution. That's something you should know. And this means that the, the eta is obtained by log transforming our the means of our the of, of our response variable and the variance function is just mu which means um, if you if you enter this into the um, into this function then we have the variance of y is given by this Persian parameter multiplied with the mean so we have basically a linear function here and that basically is a straight line and we saw this already on the figure two for this for this and on one of the previous in one of the previous figures that motivated the de development and then we have the binomial case uh, the binomial case here is given by the odds the logarithm of the odds so we discussed this already we have we had in our example p divided by 1 minus p here we have mu divided by n minus mu so because in our example we use the probability and the probability can only or not ex exceed 1 or 100 and uh, but in different cases that we discussed for example if we count the number of dead animals you can have the n as the number of the maximum number of animals the cases and the mu the number of of successes in a trial or the number of deaths uh, due to a concentration. So we discussed this before. This is just a different expression of our equation. You should be able to capture this. In the past, people often transformed data to reach normal distribution, so they would not need to use the GLM. Some decades ago, the reason for this may have been as well that that um, calculation, if you do this by hand, when the computers were just less powerful, if you do this by hand, the linear regression model is very easy to calculate by hand. This does not hold for the GLM. Nowadays, we should rather use the GLM if you have data um, that is is not um, that is not fulfilling the assumptions that you have for for that that does not meet the assumptions that you have for the linear model regarding your response variable um, because generally if you transform the data before linear regression model then this can lead to biased estimates a higher variance and lower power new experiments and you see a couple of references in the notes to the slide where you could look more detailed into this issue Here's another over overview which type of error distribution and potential link function you should use, which canonical link function. Note that often we use the error distribution and a specific link function that, uh, that, 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 that is most often used. For example, with the Gaussian normal distribution, we often use the link function. However, these are not intrinsically linked, so you could also use different link functions. And you saw this example uh, for the number of offspring that we modeled. We saw in the, uh, in the two cases. In one case, we had a constant variance, so we would use the Gaussian normal distribution 
and the identity link as link function the identity link just means that you have the um, what we saw in the slide before that the that the eta that the echo eta just equals the mu it's 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 the identity link um alternatively we saw that when we have the number of offspring although we have a normal dis a normal error distribution we could have that um, we might also have an link function a, a log link for example if we have an increase in the variance along the gradient along uh, with increasing number of offspring same holds for count data for proportion and for binary data i'm not going into detail here what is really important to capture is that typically you have um, you, you use the Poisson distribution or the negative binomial distribution for count data so for the number of offsprings for the number of species that you find in uh, different samples and you for proportional data for example the number of successes and the total number of trials but successes um, is, is just a statistical term here number of, of uh, defined events so number of deaths um, to total organisms could also be the proportion and in such cases you often use the logistic regression the logit model and different um, and alternative link functions are given in the right column here note that this negative binomial distribution which is often used for count data is just an extension of the Poisson distribution it adds a different parameter to make this distribution more flexible so final aspect of the model that of the generalized linear model that we need to discuss is the deviance in fact when you fit such a model model you notice that you don't obtain an r square value directly you you obtain you do not obtain the sum of square that the glm minimizes the deviance and this is because in the back we do not have an ordinary least squares regression but we have a maximum likelihood estimation that is running and this algorithm estimates the model parameters conditional on the sample data so it estimates um for the for different sets of parameters how high the likelihood is to generate the observed data um, i'm not going into more technical details here but i provide you with a couple of textbooks um, and references where this is this, this explained in more detail you could theoretically based on the deviance calculate uh, pseudo r squares or called pseudo r squares pseudo r square but we are not i'm not going into details here they also have um, their drawbacks some of them but as i said it's beyond the scope of this course you see on the bottom of the slide how this uh, deviance is calculated for different for different error structures we see for the normal distribution that is not um, that is not novel to us. We see that we that we um, subtract the fitted or the observations from the mean of the observations and square that. Um, so that's then then we have the variance function. Uh, of one we see for the Poisson distribution how we calculate the deviance and so on but we don't go into more details here another issue that we discussed extensively for the linear model is model selection so when we have multiple explanatory variables which ones should be included in the linear in, in the linear regression model that's a topic that we discussed extensively and for the generalized linear model we are actually 
don't need to discuss this again because we can use the same methods as for the multiple linear regression model. And if you look into the R demonstration, we actually see that most of the techniques are implemented in a very, very similar way. So we don't need to learn something new here. So what we discussed for the linear model where we can uh, find the best subset, so we compute all possible models, uh, we select the course and we then take the best of, of all models or we average a couple of models that are similarly good goodness of fit measure. We can use different goodness of fit measures for in model to model averaging as we discussed before. You could do stepwise model selection starting either with the full model or a null model or an intermediate model and then do stepwise model selection either by employing a hypothesis test for the individual regression for coefficients, that's in the case of the GLM, the VALT test. However, uh, it is cautioned in the literature that you not, should not use this test if the true value, for example, in the logistic regression is very small or very large compared um, to the to the um, are very close to zero or very far away from zero. And I give some more details um, on the slide. The log, the log likelihood ratio test is a more robust alternative that should be generally preferred. Um, so especially if you have, for example, an experiment where, where for example, in the, in, uh, for a uh, treatment all organisms died then you are then you um or none of the organisms died then you have the case where the wild test is, doesn't work very well the log likelihood ratio test does not take into the is not done for the individual regression coefficients but compares the x the differences um in the log likelihoods of two complete models so it's similar to the ANOVA that we did for the linear model. Then you have stepwise model selection via information theoretic approaches. That's where the log likelihood has already been included before that we discussed before. In the case of the simple linear regression model, it just was the sum of squares that we used. Um, here we use the log likelihood, but I'm not going into details here. It's not really important for us. Um, and we can use post-selection shrinkage, so shrink the parameters after we fitted the model or use the lasso. And that is what we do in our demonstration in R. After we did the modeling, we need to check our assumptions. The assumptions again are relatively similar to those of the linear model. So we have the assumption of independence of observations. We discussed before that in the case of temporal or spatial autocorrelation. So in case you measured spatial data, then you may have more similar observations of data that are close than those that are distant. You may have a spatial data that you need to take into account, or if you have temporal autocorrelation, which means that you sample, that you, that you um, measure again um, data from one individual again and again, then you certainly have a correlation um, for, for one individual that you measure. And so the, the data that you measure later are dependent on the previous stage of the individual, for example. Um, in such cases, you need to use generalized linear mixed models, uh, but we don't go into details in this class of models here, but you can should look into the paper of Benjamin Borker. We assume a linear relationship between the link function and the predictors, so between the, better, or better to say, between um, the eta and the explanatory variables and this can be checked with the component residual plot and this is shown in our R demonstration. In the case of nonlinearity you should use 
nonlinear nonlinear or non-parametric regression, for example, generalized additives models. And uh, for an introduction to these, please take the book of uh, Sewer et al. from 2007. We should check, we, or we assume that there are that the observations are not that there are no observations that are overly influential, and this is what we checked before. So we could either use graphical dia diagnostics um, and uh, calculate some me measures and look at them graphically, or you could look at the measures directly, for example, DF betas or Cook's distance that we discussed already for the linear regression model. The DF betas means that we describe or that we calculate the standardized change in the in the betas, so the regression coefficients when we refit the model um, several times. So and each of the times where we fit the model again we leave out one ob one observation and then check how much the the betas change for this or uh, for this observation if this observation is left out and clearly um, we should not have a strong change ideally we should not have a strong change if we leave out certain certain um, observations finally and this is new that we haven't heard this before. We assume a specific mean to variance relationship that we have specified through our um, variance function. And we assume that this matches our data. So we should not have over or under dispersion. What does over and under dispersion mean graphically? We will see this on the next slide. And we can diagnose this with graphical diagnosis or looking at the QQ plot and, and uh, we could calculate the dispersion parameter and um, see whether this matches with, two, with our assumption. As a rule of thumb, if the overall under dispersion um, is, exceeds 2 or is smaller than 0 0.5, then we should do something about that and perhaps use a different model. So on this slide we see an example of data that are over dispersed. So we have the Poisson GLM, that's the blue line, and we simulate some data from the related Poisson distribution. This is the blue dots we see they scatter in a, in, a, in a certain matter in a certain distance around this line but the observations that we have scatter much stronger around this line so we see the, the line can be used for perhaps for fitting the mean of the data but it does is not appropriate the model is not appropriate um, can uh, model it with the Poisson error distribution. In such cases, you should either use the negative binomial distribution, for example, or you could also add additional, an additional parameter to the model and use um, a quasi likely a quasi likelihood estimation, um, the quasi binomial or quasi Poisson model in this case. If you are a beginner and you notice that something is severely wrong, that this is most likely because you did uh, wrong an incorrect specification of the distribution or link function and you should first check the plausibility and make sure that this is really correct before you try to estimate the mean to variance function um, with a quasi binomial model. And we end the session with a with the link to the demonstration. So for the demonstration, we will work with a data set on the southern Corroboree frog. This species is critically endangered, and our research question is therefore 
which environmental parameters have the highest explanatory power for the occurrence of the frog because clearly if we want to build design conservation programs then we need to know um, what variables actually influence the distribution of this frog. And you should try yourself to which extent you are able to apply the GLM in practice and identify the variables with the highest exponential power for the occurrence of the predipus. And data is given to you and you find some starting lines in the end of the script for the R demonstration. So that's it so far for the GLM. I hope you enjoyed this part and do some reading in case you still have open questions.